Eaten Alive is a dialogue-heavy, character-driven romance thriller. Despite the name and cover art, it's sci-fi only very loosely. In its U.S. release, Frozen Alive suffered at the hands of anxious distributors who marketed it at, as a mad scientist horror flick to try and sell a few more tickets. Unfortunately, this cynical gaffe has made posterity a little unfair to Frozen Alive. Viewers understandably come in expecting a flesh-eating deep freeze creature a la Thing from Another World, and are frustrated to be treated to a talky drama instead. But let's ignore the marketing and try to look at Frozen Alive on its own merits. At the descriptively named Low Temperature Unit Research Facility in West Berlin, earnest scientists Frank Overton and Helen Veland are freezing experimental primates and trying to wake them up again. We thrill as they negotiate with staid administrators for project funding and give presentations about the long-term benefits of cryogenics and lengthening human life, promoting deep space travel and the like. But the first thing we notice at home is the palpable romantic tension between Frank and Helen. The second thing we notice is that they seem themselves not to have noticed. That is, when they claim their own relationship strictly professional, they act like what they really believe in. I don't see why. Ours has just been a happy working relationship. Not so easily fooled is Frank's wife, Joan who responds to this threat to her marriage by turning to drink and cultivating an ambivalent affair with Tony, a dashing ex-flame. Largely oblivious to Joan's trouble, troubles and reckless in his desire for research funding, Frank decides to try the freezing process on himself. But just as, with Helen's help, he does so, Joan's addiction and jealousy spiral into disaster. The law suspects, absurdly to my mind, that Frank planned to freeze himself to evade legal inquiry, and now Helen must deal not only with the police but also with the possibility that she might botch the complicated resuscitation technique. If she does, Frank will die at her hand. Setting aside the irate comments of those expecting The Thing from Another World Part 2, Frozen Alive actually has a few things going for it. Not least that it's directed by Bernard Knowles. His most notable gig was as Alfred Hitchcock's cinematographer on The 39 Steps, Secret Agent, and Sabotage. He also lends to the gothic masterpiece Gaslight. For Frozen Alive, Knowles alternates between two major moods. Helen and Frank's bright clinical lab with its harsh fluorescent lights, contrasted with Tony's modest but tasteful, elegant flat. But the visual cues Knowles gives us are misleading. The lab may seem lifeless, but Frank and Helen's love flourishes there. Life does too in the resuscitations they perform. On the other hand, Tony's apparently warm, lively apartment is really a place of dwindle, decay, and death. Knowles and writer El Evelyn Frazier seem to be after a similar irony as they navigate Frozen Alive's sci-fi subplot. And make no mistake, the love quadrangle is always the movie's main concern. Clearly in love, Frank and Helen sublimate their passion so uh, thoroughly that they don't even know it's there. Their selfless devotion to a greater cause gives them the strength to be fiercely stoic as they work. This love, though, is stronger than the bond between Joan and Tony. Their frank and passionate indulgences might seem like a quicker path to love, but the opposite proves true. All this takes on another layer of irony when you consider the fascination that brings Frank and Helen together. Cryogenics, this desire to enhance life's abundance tomorrow by packing it in ice.